We're going to pray again here in just a second. I, I, my heart was touched for those that have been involved in the Kimco explosion here in Crosby, Texas. We were, uh, I was here with a couple of friends on Tuesday when it just happened, just rolled in, when the plume went up and then uh, started getting the word about the, uh, the tragedy of a young man who lost his life. As a matter of fact, we've got people here in the church that work at Kimco, and uh, we just want to pray for comfort. I can promise you this, there had to be angels around those men and women there to protect as many as that were protected, and it's very important. Father, I love you. I thank you first for the Word of God that changes our lives and transforms us and makes us into new creatures. It's amazing what your transforming power does. And God, I pray for those that were in the Kimco uh, accident and the explosion, that you put angels around them, comfort them, strengthen them. Lord, I know that there are repercussions mentally that take place in our mind, the fear of going back, the fear of stepping back in, the fear of getting back on the horse, the bike, stepping back in the plants, and all these things, God, run through our minds. God, I pray for protection of the mind, that you would strengthen, that you would give us the ability to step back out and risk life again. We love you. We're not crazy, God. We just need your protection in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. Come on, give me a big amen. 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 John chapter 12, are you comfortable? Do you know what the, the, the two greatest complaints about church is? Sermons are boring and people are unfriendly. I'm here to change that. Can I get an amen? Amen. For over 26 years, I've been trying to change to certain boring so I don't. I, I think the Word of God ought to come alive in your mind. You ought to be able to see it. I so enjoyed preaching Tuesday and Wednesday night, midweek. And Wednesday night, we had a young man that, that played some music. And, and it was like he even, he even posted that. He said, I, I feel like I was in my home church when y'all sent me out. And this young man is going all over the, the U.S. as a singer, uh, Justin Gambino. Tremendous, tremendous uh, talent. So we're glad to have him out there. Hopefully, we'll get him back in both churches when he gets back around. But it's just good to hear a young man say, I felt like I was in my home church. I felt like my beginning was, was a great thing. And so, and he just came to sing. That's all. Uh, he was, there was nothing promised to him at all. So, uh, and then the sermon. The, it was so easy to preach the Word of God after that. John chapter 12, verse 27. You know that we're heading toward uh, the garden experience. We're heading toward the, the, the grave. We, we, before we get to the grave, we'll have Golgotha. We'll have what took place there as we move into Easter. So all these things are moving into this season. But Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 27, Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. We spoke on this point this hour uh, a couple weeks ago. The word hour here is a, is a, a term, a time, a season. Uh, it, he knew that it was coming. He knew that it was fixing to happen. He didn't talk about so much as dying as he did talk about glorifying. So he said, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of faith, the, the, excuse me, the kind of death he was going to die. When I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Let me mention this to you. We lift up God in our walk. We lift up God with our voice. We lift up God in the things that we do. But this is important in your life. He said, when I be lifted up, I'm going to draw people to me. One of the goals of this church and every church in America and the world should be is to lift up Jesus. When you lift him up, when you magnify him, when you bring him way up here, people see him. And it ain't about you. It's so that God can be glorified. And let me just break it down a little bit further. The more hungry you are for God, the quicker you get healed. The quicker you get blessed, the quicker you get. And it's funny how when you read the word, and I know some of you, bless your heart, you weren't born with a temperament of being noisy. You were just quiet. It's who I am. I get I don't know what temperament blind Bartimaeus had, but he started screaming out, Son of David, have mercy on me. I don't know what kind of temperament Jairus had, but when his little daughter was dying, he went to Jesus and started yanking on him and pulling him through the crowd. I don't know what kind of temperament the woman with the issue of blood had, but she went in through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment because she needed healing. Sometimes you just got to get a little bit loud no matter what your temperament is. That was a cue. 
All right? For you Baptists, that was a cue. That's your time to shout right there. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. We want to lift him up. We want to lift him up in all the things that we do. My pastor has been on a cane. Uh, Kenny, he's got got a bad hip, you know, and he struggled with that hip, and he struggled. He's been on a cane. He told me, he said, I was laying on the floor working on a table this week, and he said, oh, I've been praying for healing because I know I'm coming down. I got to have a, have a, a replacement. He said, as I got up, I felt no pain. And I love how he described it to me. He said, I walked, and he's telling me, like, like just, he said, I'm walking, and I don't feel no, and I said, Lord, are you doing this to me? Are you doing this? To-? He said, I walked out to the shed, and I got my tools, and I came back in, and I said, I, and it's like, I'm reaching, I'm thinking, now I'm going to, do I need, do I need to reach for the camera? He said, now I'm still feeling good. And this morning, I heard it in his voice. He said, man, I feel so good. I called my team and said, rejoice for me. I believe I'm under a healing right now. Amen. And I love that because it's not always the miraculous that takes place, but every now and then God just kind of creeps up on you, and you come down with a healing. You got to rethink your thinking. All of you come down with a sickness. How about coming down with a healing? My kids will drink after me when they're sick because they'll get well if they drink after me. I said you got to rethink your thinking. Amen? Amen. If he's living in you, I promise you, 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 you get what you believe. If you don't want to believe it, that's up to you. But I, I'm just crazy enough to give it a shot. For 30-something years. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing. Rest on me today and speak through me as your oracle. I need your help. Thank you for touching my pastor. Thank you for giving him this relief that he needs right now. And I ask you to bless this house in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. God bless you. You may be seated. It's so easy to lose sight of our priorities. When Jesus is going through where he's going, all kinds of things we talked about this a week ago could have distracted him. He didn't allow uh, his disciples to distract him, the festivity to distract him, uh, Judas to distract him. He stayed on it, and he stayed after his hour. The the parable of the Great Supper, and if I just break it down into one verse, says this in Luke 14, verse 23. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes. Everybody say country. Say country. You know what I'm talking about. Country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. It's always been the will of God that his house grow, that the house would be full. And then he compels us. And I have taught you. And I don't mean, I'm not going to be mean, mean, but, I, but I, I, not to be mean, but I've taught you and taught you and taught you that it's important for us to take what we've heard. Gospel hardened is when we've heard too much, we've done too little. We have opportunity over the next few weeks to do something with what we've heard. You've got more gospel in you than, than nine-tenths of the world has ever, will ever hear or hear preached. You've heard the best, not just from me, but from other people who have shared the word of God from this pulpit and other places. You know it. You pick it up on the internet. You've heard the gospel. He says, go out, go out, tell us to go out and to, to the roads and the country lanes. I, I, I went out Friday night. I took my dog with me. How many know I got a big dog? If I'd have took a chihuahua, it would have made no difference. If I'd have took a poodle, I'd have been laughed at. Sorry, Sam. Uh, Sam don't have a poodle, but he do got a little dog. But when I brought that big dog into that parking lot with all that, that car show going on there, and I had them flyers, people were coming up to me taking muscle car Sunday flyers. Somebody said, why would you bring your dog? Because I'm ugly. But my dog gets everybody's attention, 130 pounds, and he looks mean, but he's sweet. He's just sweet, sweet dog. Amen. But I, because I, I didn't have my car to use, but anything, what I'm saying is I used a hook. I used just a hook to bring it, to bring it around. Many of you know I took my dog one time to Home Depot, brought him in there. A man saw it, looked at the dog. He said, I want a dog like that. And I said, well, it's possible you could get one. And then he looked at me and he said, well, uh, we got talking about what I do. I told him I'm a pastor, and uh, this, my dog loves Jesus. He starts crying in Home Depot, follows me out to my car, comes over to the ranch. I prayed with him, and then he ended up doing the floor in my house. Listen, every now and then God give you an idea, work it. Work it. Amen. I bring, <laughs> I know, some of you, I don't bring your dog. Please don't bring your dog. Uh, but but I, if you got one like that, you can use it. No church grows without guests. To our guests, I, I thank you for coming today. That just means a lot in the early service. But warning, a crowd is not a church, but can be developed into one. Many years ago, we developed this idea of getting a crowd out. And, of course, yes, free barbecue does help, David. It, it helps everyone. 
You know, you're going to get a free meal on a Sunday where you ain't got to wait in line or at least a long line, and it's going to it's not going to cost you. But that's not the point. The point is when we get the crowd, can God help us to enlarge our churches and use it to be a blessing to the kingdom of God? We need to attract unbelievers. We need to edify believers. And there's a difference in unbelievers and believers. You remember before you became born again that you came into church and you thought, well, I don't know about this. I know how I felt. Every time I came to church, it was like, you got to go to the front and give your life to Jesus. And I, I was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. I'd go to church, and the preacher would go on and on and on. How many somebody knows land the plane, please? And if, you, if there's 50, 60 people in the church, everybody knows who the guest is. So everybody looking at the guests, whether you're in a Pentecostal or a Baptist church, it don't matter. They after you. So here I am in the back. And my friends, this literally happened over and over. Every time I gave in as a young man to go to church, my friends would look at me and go, go to the front. I said, what I say? They said, just tell them you lied. Okay. And I went to the front, and the preacher would look at me, and he'd say, uh, 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 this young man's come forward to confess his, his sins before God. I, I didn't want to confess my sins before. Listen, 13, 14 years old, I started drinking. When, I drank my first beer when I was 6, started smoking when I was 12. And doing, you don't even know what I was doing at 14, 15, and 16 years of age. So here I am in front of that, of that preacher, and I'm staring at it, and he says, and he looked down at me, and I didn't know he was going to tell everybody. He said, now, what did you do? And I said, I lied. He lied. Boy, I'm glad I didn't tell him, Frank, what I'd really done. <laughs> he, that's why the Bible says confess your faults one to another. Amen. It don't say tell, tell the preacher, please don't tell me. I'm not your priest. Can I get an amen? Talk to him about your stuff. I don't really want to hear it because I gossip. Okay. <laughs> so I would have this problem with, with, with as a, as a, and then when I gave my life to Christ at 18, 19 years of age, things did change. And it wasn't about confessing. I, it was a peace that came over me. It was, and I, I so have wanted that. And yes, I'm a pastor. I've been a youth pastor. But my greatest passions in my life has been in being an evangelist, reaching people for Jesus. I just want to reach them. And if I have to do this to do it, I'll do it. But I love reaching people. I love seeing the smile on their face. I love seeing the change in their lives. I love when people come in contact with the living God and realize that he's the same God that's in that Bible. Amen. Sent his son to die for us. There's something absolutely amazing about being born again. 1 Corinthians tells us that there is a difference in believers and unbelievers. Paul had to deal with it in the church. Sometimes the church world gets hit real hard, and spirituality takes a fight, and it gets on fire, and everybody gets excited. And, and, and maybe the Holy Ghost hits, and people get tongue-talking and things. But Paul said, whoa, 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 listen. If you're praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving? What he means by that, if you're praising God, speaking in other tongues out loud, and you're going on and on, and somebody comes in who's an unbeliever, say to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying. Now, I'm not going to apologize. I've been a tongue talker for over 30-something years. And just because you haven't heard me doesn't mean that I don't do it in my private time of praying. Amen. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with you doing that. But I can tell you this. You come to church and it sounds like a turkey farm going in there and you don't know Jesus, it will drive you out of the building. You will run scared, man. You'll get back to your bar as quick as you can. Okay. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So there's a difference in believers and unbelievers. And learning how to bring that balance in is so, so important. So, you know, some have talked, well, Pastor, what we need is two different services. I think we can have a balance. I don't think we have to have an early morning service for the charismaniacs and a second service for the, for the not-so-charismaniacs. Amen. We could do it all together. Can I get an amen? In order to do this, though, we must be driven by purpose. Purpose has to be in our life, and that is to know Christ and to make him known. Now, I'm going to take you to a very familiar passage here in Luke chapter 5. And, and, and it's, it stands out to me so much at a time like this. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw the when it says listening to the word of God, it didn't mean that Jesus opened the Bible. He was the word. So when he spoke, Luke said, you know what? I heard the word of God today. Every time Jesus opened his mouth, it was the words of God. He was talking. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and one belonging to Simon. You know, that's Pete. And asked him to put out a little from the shore. When he sat down and talked to people from the boat, when he had finished speaking, 
he said to Simon, put out into the water and let down the nets for a catch. Peter answered, Master, we worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. The church has worked hard. This church has. Other churches I know have. But the church of God around the world is working hard. We've been, we've been fishing. We've been trying to do what Jesus says do. And there comes a time when you say, I just, I'm tired. I, there's, I've been working all night. I've been working all year. I've been doing this, this, this. But here's in my heart. The scripture says, if I faint not, I will reap. If I keep on doing, if I keep on sowing, if I keep on casting. You know, David and Richard, a couple of them went fishing the other night. It, it, and I'm going to tell you, Richard told me he got in at 4 in the morning. I don't know what you do to him, David, but evidently y'all are addicted. But you don't, ca- you don't catch unless you're casting. You got to keep casting. You got to keep throwing out. And many times the church gets tired, but wouldn't you want to see your children saved? Wouldn't you want to see your family saved? Well, don't you want to see your friends get, get, get no Christ? So you can't give up on this moment. Amen. Like David said, if it takes 20 bucks, it, it'll take 20, whatever it takes for me to connect with them. So he says that Simon said, we worked hard. If they done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon, now Peter, saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. We have all felt this inadequacy for the task. We've always felt, if I tell them about Christ, they know my life. They know, they're, they're my neighbors. They know me. What will they think? I don't care what they think. Amen. Let them know that the grace of God is on you. The mercy of God has saved you. Reach out to them. Connect with them. You ain't got to wait to get perfect to get to church. You ain't got to wait to get dressed up to get to the house. Just get to the house. Amen. And watch and see what God's done. Well, when I get well, I'm going to the hospital. You crazy? This is the hospital for people that are spiritually in need. Amen. And sometimes physically and mentally in need. It it shifts everything. It changes. So Peter said, depart from me. I'm a wicked man. And I've always felt that if Jesus could see those fish, he could look inside Peter's heart. He knows our heart. I I sat in the back a while ago, and I prayed just a little bit more before I came out. And I said, God, you know my inadequacy. You know my sin. You know my heart. You know my life. And and yet here I am. I'm your oracle. Speak through me. Work through me. I so want to reach people for you. I want not to. And again, guys, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm getting to be more and more global than just local. Because of the internet and the way we're able to reach people, we've got to start thinking outside the box. Amen. It's got to grow just a little bit more. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Sometimes you just got to keep reading the, the red. You got to keep reading what he said. I'm, I'm going to catch men. He said, I'm going to catch men. I can do this. Everybody say, I can do this. Can. Say it again. Can. You can win somebody. You can do this it, by your actions, by your words, sometimes by simple invitation. But there's always opportunity. Pastor Mike, again, I talked to him this morning, and he told me about a lady. This, this is how me and him talk and converse. He lives up in the St. Louis area, and he said to me, he said, I got a lady coming to church today. I want you to pray that she comes. She ain't been to church in 10 years. I said, okay. Well, that was last week. Then this week, he said, that lady's coming back to church. God has touched her life because when she was seven years old, she walked into her, her dad's uh, living room, and there was a man. His friend was weeping. It was Rick's, Rick's friend was weeping. Being seven years old, she walked up to him, put her hands on him, and saw him, and she called him Uncle something because he was a friend to her dad and said, Jesus loves you, and Jesus is going to take care of you. Seven years old. Seven years old. Walks out of the room. The man gives his life to Christ through this other guy. Walks out of the room as, he, as, as, as she leaves the room. Now, that, she's seven. So the man converts to Christ. Then she gets married later in life, has children. He comes to her, her uh, uh, to see the kids. This relationship has gone on. After her second child was born, he was killed in a motorcycle wreck. And the only thing that happened at that funeral was this little girl was seven years old. Your children can lead them to Jesus. Amen. Pray for them. Touch them. Amen. You, you don't know how all this stuff converses in life. Every church is driven by something. You know, to drive means to guide, to control, to direct. My message thought is his hour, this hour, our hour. We got an hour. We got a season. We got an opportunity as a church to reach people. And by the way, don't you, uh, uh, don't you love a catch? I mean, literally, David, I know you sent me pictures immediately. As soon as you catch fish, he's sending me pictures. 
the biggest ugly black drums you ever seen. Just big ugly fish. I said, that one's ugly. Richard asked, are you David or the fish? Amen. But, but both the uh, ugly. It's ugly. But, but there's something about the catch. There's something about seeing what's going to come in. And I get excited about seeing what's going to come in. Who's coming in next? Who's giving their life to Christ? I'll do a funeral tomorrow. And we, it, while I'm doing that funeral, I'm thinking to myself, who's going to come in? Who am I going to catch? Even through this funeral that, that I'll be able to reach people. There's something about connecting and to see that I still watch the deadliest catch and I know it's only going to be crabs I know what's coming up on the deck but I got to see it. I just got to see it. And it's the same way I go to church because I just got to see it. Some churches are driven. They're driven by tradition. Mom and dad went here. I, you know, my mom and dad were Lutherans. I'm a Lutheran. My kids are going to be Lutherans. Some churches are driven by personalities. Let me tell you, that's not wrong. God gives personalities to churches. Person, without a personality, you would sure be boring. Amen. So thank God for that. Uh, finances. Some churches are driven by, in, in, you know, in a big church. They have money. They don't need to be res, as responsible. I believe in equal sacrifice. But big churches, I, I've seen big churches, little congregations. How did that have? Because so-and-so loved that church so much, they left their money, this money, that money, these presbyterian, presbyter, whatever. Amen. Uh, churches like that, uh, big, big Catholic churches, whatever. It doesn't matter what kind they are, but you'll see them grow through that. Some churches are driven by programs. They got youth. They got Sunday school. They got age classes. I like people interest. I like things that you're interested in. Amen. To connect. It's hard for me to stick uh, 30 and 35-year-olds in a class when, 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 when 30, 35-year-olds get along better with the 50, 55-year-olds. You know, so, so it's easier to do it with interest. That's why we talk about the Harleys, Hot Rods, Horses, Empty and Hell, the things we like to do. Building, some, people, some churches are driven just because they got a good-looking building. I said, I, <laughs> this, this is a cute church. I'm not going to lie to you. This is a church. Looks like a church. I get out to New Caney. I look at our church. I drive by, and I open my eyes like a guest. And I go, this, the property's pretty, but this is one ugly church. I'm like the parent with the ugly kid that thinks he's, he's handsome all the time. He's a good-looking boy, and everybody lies to me to make me feel good. Don't look around. You got those kids, too. Some are driven by events. We use, I, I love events. Uh, some are guests. You know, they're people sensitive and friendly. But whatever drives a church, it should be pulled by purpose. It's got to be fueled by purpose. Church should build with purpose. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Purpose, exalting Christ, reaching people, knowing him, making him known. I've used this phrase forever, W-I-N, to win, to win the loss, to integrate the body, to nurture people. If we can just win people. If we can integrate those people, if we can nurture those people, then we've won. When you know your purpose, when you know your DNA, and that's the other thing. Uh, I talked with Pastor Rick uh, Hawkins. Many of you know Rick, pastor now in Oklahoma City or in Norman, Oklahoma. And, and he was telling his staff, and I was there when, after he had done it, every church needs a DNA. you got to find out what it is that drives you. Uh, I see, as a matter of fact, can I just say, I saw Rick taking some of my stuff and using it in his church. It made me feel good. It just makes you feel good. Because, you know, I saw they got a hugs ministry. I started hugs a long time ago, helping uplift God's saints. I remember doing that. I remember working through, trying to uplift it and be a blessing. But when, when you know your purpose, you have your DNA. I, one day you're going to have a different pastor. Because <laughs> I ain't going to be here forever. I ain't saying I'm leaving anytime soon. I, I might get 5, 10, 20 years. But one day I'm going to be gone. And some of you younger people come up, you're going to get a different guy. When it happens, the DNA may change. But all churches have a DNA. Our DNA is to reach people. It's always been to reach people. If we rode a horse, it was to reach people. If we were burning rubber, it was reaching people. If we went on a bike ride, it was reaching people. That tower out there on that tower, when, when I'm on that zip line, I'm about reaching people. Sally, it was so much fun throwing you off the tower this week. Amen. She said, please pray for me and tell Frank I love him. And look at you. You made it. You made it. You made it off the tower. We got 30 ladies out there that we, we, we were blessed with. Uh, but, but they come up. They want to pray up there. And we pray with them and love on them. Uh, it's, uh, the camp is about reaching people. If we're not reaching, then we're going to stagnate and die. We'll just die. We'll be like the Dead Sea. We've got to keep reaching. 
We got when Easter hits, I'm praying this place is so packed. I got to stand on top of that. I got to throw a plank on that baptistry, and I got to get up there. By the way, if you want to get baptized, I'll baptize you on Easter. How about that? If you want to get dunked, I'll dunk you up here. But I, I hope I got to stand up there, and y'all pack me, push me all the way back. Amen. Oh, y'all, I got one amen right here on the front row. How many like to see a full house on Easter? Amen. amen. I would love to see that. So, so we want to win. It builds morale. When you know your purpose, it does build morale. It reduces frustration. Everybody knows what we're here to do. It allows concentration. You become focused. You have more efficiency. You're doing the right things. You're effective. You're doing the right things, not more things. I don't want to do more things. I just want to do the right thing. If I do the right thing, I do more things. So I, I remember in my life, I got so busy, busy. I remember one time I, had, I was over 22 different ministries. That's too many. Every time somebody come up with a new idea, bowling for blessings, karate for Christ, uh, you know, uh, what, what, whatever it was, uh, uh, horsing around for heaven. I, 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 it drove me nuts. But I said, yes, 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 yes. And then I had to meet with all these people. It was too busy. We weren't doing the right thing. We were doing too many things. What is busy? Being under Satan's yoke. I don't want to be busy. I want to be effective. I just want to get done what God called us to do. Some of you, bless your heart, I just set you free right then. You realize you have been too busy. Quit using the word. Make yourself bite your tongue. Quit saying it. Quit saying it. A lot of times when I call people and say, well, you do, I'm busy. They're not busy. They only say that to make themselves feel more important. Oh, I'm sorry. Be effective. Be a fa- uh, Jesus did. J- Jesus was so simple. He t- came to win the lost, amen, and destroy the devil. It was that simple. He was just doing that. That's what he did. He kept it simple. Keep it that way. First Peter 4, verse 10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This hour is our hour. To use the gift that God gave you. What gift did he give you? Oh, you've been sitting on it. I mean, you, you know what you've been doing with your gift. God gave you a gift. He gave you a gift to serve. He gave you a gift to be a blessing. He gave you a gift to organize. He gave you a gift. And many times our gifts could turn into our occupation. It started out as a job, and then it becomes an occupation, becomes a career. Next thing you know, we're making money with the gift that God gave us. My, my, my. Isn't God good? Amen. So what's the business of our church? It's to make him known. How's business? Well, we need to do a little better. We need to do a little better. Uh, how, how, how do we communicate our business? Of course, we communicate it with slogans and symbols and stories and, and specifics. The scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, tells us this. For I know the plans I have. I know the, the things I've planned for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Do you believe that? Look at that scripture again. You found it? Are you there, Mike? Jeremiah 29, you got you locked down, huh? That's okay. Jeremiah 29, 11. They know the scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. We want a future. I want my kids to have a future. I want your grandkids of mine to have a future. Amen. In order to do that, we got to keep reaching. We got to keep building. We got to keep working. You know, I'm looking at uh, the, uh, is it Gans or Gaines? Gan. Uh, uh, Michelle and Don here. When I met them, they came out to the ranch to help us walk blind people on horseback. That's where I met y'all. It all started from there. And it was just, so here we, we're using horses and, and the blind and brought a couple didn't even know us come in to help us walk them around. Now they in the house. Amen. Being a blessing in the house. It's amazing how God orchestrates and does what he does. I've had the blessing to go to the West Coast. I've been down Highway 1. I've stopped by the huge light tower. Uh, what do they call those things? Lighthouses. You know, and I see those. It's so beautiful. And they, they become a tourist attraction. But I read this story. And it, it just spoke to me. Of an old 
community of people who lived on a stretch of dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occurred. And that's the reason the lighthouse is there, to let them know this is dangerous. There's cliffs here and there's rocks and waves. And eventually, some of the townspeople decided to put some time and effort and money into a rescue operation. A small life-saving station was built. The devoted members of the rescue team kept an ongoing watch over the sea, ready to man their little boat to search for survivors in case of a shipwreck. As a result, the town became famous because of the many lives that were saved. More and more people joined the team. Soon a new building was erected. It was much larger than the first little building. It was beautifully furnished and decorated. But as more and more amenities were added, new pews, new tables, PA systems, carpet, pretty wood, decorations were added for the rescue members for the rescue of the members' pleasure and comfort, the new building was slowly transformed into kind of a clubhouse. As a result, some members began to lose interest in the rescue operation. But when a shipwreck occurred, and many survivors were rescued and brought into the clubhouse for first aid during this period, which lasted several days, the frenzied activity caused the attractive clubhouse to be considerably marred by such things as bloodstains, on the carpet at the next meeting there was a split in the membership most members felt that the life-saving operation was a hindrance to the social life of the operation and those who disagreed were told they could build another little station further down the coast as the years went by history continued to repeat itself today so the story goes the seacoast has a number of exclusive clubhouses dotting the shoreline but no one in the area seems to be concerned about the rescue operation I've watched church after church after church in my lifetime be built. And they build with a rescue attitude. We're going to win people. We're going to do this. Let it always be my heart cry, no matter how big our churches get, no matter how much God does for us, that we are about winning souls, that we're about rescuing people. I'm still reminded when Hurricane Katrina hit, we were at one church then, if you remember, and we took people off the freeway, and they brought them off I-10 who, were, who had lost their homes. They came with their dogs. They came with their addictions. They came living together. Sixteen families moved onto our property, and we took care of them. We fed them. It was the beginning of what is known as the clothing ministry out there in Tatum's Pantry and feeding them and looking after them. We didn't talk to them. We didn't, I didn't interview them. Do you have an addiction? Do you have? One couple came. I remember, I'll never forget them. Guy and Rose came. They were living together. We didn't say, you can't come into this church living together. I can't move you on the property living together. We just brought them in, rescued them. Two weeks later, they were walking down the aisle, and I married them right there in the church. No, no, don't tell me what God can and can't do. We saw a miracle after miracle, but don't let us ever get to the place where we say, oh, this is so nice. This is so lovely. You know, it's, it's so pretty. We, we can't damage this place. God forbid that we ever get to the place. And I'm not trying to say tear up the church. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying disrespect the house. I'm saying let us keep using what we got to win people to Jesus. Amen. 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 Lord, I sit here humbly. My heart is so, it ain't just about the, what's going to happen next week, but it's about Easter and it's the week after and the week after. God, if we ever get to the place where we get comfortable and say, well, this is all we need, rebuke us, chastise us, shake us, remind us. God, there's more in this life than just us. Lord, when I preached my sister's funeral, I knew that you had covered her and touched her. When I preached my daddy's funeral, I know you saved my dad and you rescued him. From, from, from what he had been. God, I know you're such a, you changed my mom. You're touching my brother. God, all through my life, I have seen the gospel work in the hearts of the people that are before me. I've seen it. To those that have gone on to be with you when I've preached their funerals, I know, God, your grace touched them. Now, God, don't let us get to a place of apathy, of not caring anymore about the rest of the world. Help us to reach them for your glory. This is our hour. Help us step into it. In Jesus' name. Everybody give God praise in this house. Would you do that?
little while back, I said, I, I, I want to win somebody to Jesus. As our servant leaders come up, I'll share the same story. I want to win somebody to Jesus. I wasn't talking about from up here. I wasn't talking about from preaching from up here. I'm talking about a mano, how you say it? Mano y mano? Mano a mano. Mano y mano. Yeah. Straight up. I went up to Colorado to see my grandkids, and Richard was with me. And I walked into a clothing, a western store. What do you do when you're away from town, Pastor? I shop. Yeah, yeah, I'm like one of you ladies. I'm going, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to hit the clearance sale, find me <laughs> another vest and some more cowboy stuff. So I go shopping. I'm in the big R. Shopping. This Hispanic lady is helping me. And we're talking a little bit. I have no idea when it's, when it, but I, I remember saying, I want to win somebody to Jesus. Said it here in a church on Sunday. This is on a Tuesday. I looked at her, and, and uh, she said, what is it you do? And I told her, I'm a pastor. She said, oh, a priest. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm a pastor, which told me she had a, a, a background probably of a Catholic upbringing. And, I, and uh, she said, immediately, she said, I'm mad at God. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to buy clothes. I don't, I'm not here to. And she said, I'm mad at God. I said, why are you mad at God? She said, because my husband has a disease that's hurting his body, and now my son has it. And I went, oh, no, no, no. So immediately, uh, my, I'm shifting to listen to her, and I said, well, what is it that they have? And she said, you never heard of it. It's, all, it's, called, it's a muscular dystrophy disease known as Charcot Marie Tooth. And I looked at her, and I started weeping. And I said, ma'am, I have Charcot Marie Tooth. My sister died in a wheelchair with it. My mother has braces on her legs with it. My brother has deteriorated. He's on disability with it. And God has, and I didn't go into this, but in my mind I'm realizing God has protected me. He's helped me. I, you know I've had surgeries. On, I've had four surgeries on my foot. I've seen like I was in a cast more than I was <laughs> walking around some of you. Yeah. But I looked at her, and it was like God set me up. He set me up. Because never in my life have I met somebody with this disease outside of a doctor's office. So I'm looking at her, and I'm explaining to her that I have that. And, 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 my, I've had, and we begin to talk. She begins to cry. Richard, y'all know Richard. Richard is crying. Richard don't cry much. <laughs> but he's crying. He's weeping behind me because he knows I just talked about this. And then I lead her to Christ in the clothing store. I became friends with her on Facebook. I mean, it was like, if you are a woman and man enough to ask him, he'll set you up. Yeah. Amen. 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 Let him set you up. Tuesday night, we're going to preach the car show in here. Music and all. Be here Tuesday night. Be here Tuesday. Invite somebody. Why are you doing it Tuesday night? Because I'm going to ask you to come help me on Sunday. And you may be involved parking people or serving people in the cafeteria. You may be involved in taking, helping with our children or at the petting zoo. Or you may be out there registering hot rods or Harleys. And you, you may be helping our youth out with things. There's all kind of things going to go on. So if I preach to you on Tuesday night and tell you what I'm going to preach on Sunday, you ain't got to be in there to hear it. You can invite somebody. You, I don't mind you being in there if you're doing whatever you're doing, but I'm going to need everybody's help that can help. Amen. Let's not be that lighthouse that turned into a clubhouse. Amen. If you need to tie the offering envelope, amen, lift your hand. If you're giving by your phone, hold your phone up. Hold your phone. Look at it. So that way these servant leaders know that you ain't just skipping out on all this. So hold your phone. I'm giving it on my phone. You know, I'm, I'm giving through the app. I'm giving through... Texting or however it is y'all do it on here. I've never done it. I'm, I'm nervous about doing all that. <laughs> I'm still nervous about it. Don't shake your head, Dana. I don't know how to do this. I don't really want to. I will write a check today for my tithe and offering. A check. I went into AT&T and chewed them out and told them. I said, I'm tired of paying direct. Uh, uh, my direct. Uh, Auto pay? No, and all that other thing. TV. Oh. By doing this with y'all. I don't like. Send me paper. I'll write paper and send paper back to you. But I'm tired of coming in here and paying this thing with my credit card. No, you ain't getting my credit card so you can deduct it from my... Ain't happening. Because then you got me. You're tangling me up. Then I got to untangle you. 
<laughs> I know y'all into it. Y'all good with it. So if you give that way, thank you. Those online, right now, get your phone out because that's the only way you can give or you can mail us a check. Make it out to TLCC. Amen. But we appreciate all of you giving. David, if you'll come on up. And many of you have already seen these. I think they're fantastic looking. Look at that. Lord's working on them. <laughs> Amen. Big one in the back. Uh, I was with that Gambino guy on Wednesday night. Yeah. He had a T-shirt. He, 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 said he had his own shirts, too. You know, he was good. He had mm -hmm. some mugs and stuff. He had a T-shirt. It said Hope right here. Little bit right, Hope. Right, right, right. $30. $30. Hope, $30. 15 bucks and a whole lot of ink. <laughs> Dang. Heck of a deal. <laughs> Can't beat that. <laughs> uh, all right. April 6th. Has, have you guys already gone out? No. No? No, I was just making sure if they if they needed a uh, yeah. If oh no. That's what I was that's what I was I was over there giving on my phone. So I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. That's all. So uh, April 7th, Lift Ladies uh, Bible Study, um, that's today. See, I never know what the day is. I'm, I'm, I'm behind. I'm sorry. So today, right in the back, they're going to be hanging out. April 7th, Clothing Ministry in Tayden's Pantry will be open at New Caney, April 25th through the 27th. Zion's Ride to the uh, Blue Bonnets, if, like Pastor always says, just an excuse. I, I don't even think they've ever seen a blue bonnet when they went on a ride. <laughs> if they did, it was on accident, I promise. I ain't never seen them looking, but I ain't never seen a, a post on the Facebook about a flower, never nothing. It's always them eating. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Always them eating. Uh, next Saturday, this is so, so important. Uh, we're going to have a work day out at the campus. All that is is to make sure that our grounds look as excellent as possible. So that when we have a lot of guests in there, that they think and they see what it is in our heart that we want them to see. And that's excellence. We want them to see love. And how do they see that? When the trees are weed eated. When the, you know, grounds, when the playgrounds don't have weeds coming up through the slide. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Work. Amen. So this Saturday, coming up, there will be breakfast. Um, uh, it starts at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to noon. Four hours, guys. But it, as many people as we can get there, many hands make light work. Let's make light work. Because whatever we don't get done on Saturday, I'll be doing for the rest of the week. So <laughs> help me out. I love you guys. <laughs> um, kids Coke sale. Again, um, see Miss Randa. They're in the back. Where's she at? There she is. I was like, I know I saw her. Um, is there a place? Did you decide in a place? Okay. In the, in the fellowship hall. Okay. If you stack up a bunch of Cokes in the back, We'll just go ahead and assume they're for the kids, okay? Uh, see, Miss Randa, donations for TLCC Gantz Barbecue in the crock pot back there. It says barbecue. That's where we're going to put it, okay? And that's besides your tithing offering, okay? That's, that's on top of. <laughs> that is the offering, all right? Uh, sign up. Kids activities. There's all kinds of signs up in the back. We need, we need people signed up, okay? This thing does not happen without you guys. What are you saying, Miss Cheryl? Oh, there's a, okay. I, I just seen her like pointing and like doing lips, and I'm a. That's a long way from me. Yes, sir. Yeah. It is fun. It's, it's time. <laughs> All right. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Thank you. 